I would like to start. And I just heard that all people have to sit. It's not allowed in Hamburg University to stand. That was what I've been told. So please uh, try to find us lots of space in between to get a chair. So welcome you all. I'm really happy to be here. And my name is Sigrid Rostreutscher. I'm from the Goethe University in Frankfurt to have the pleasure to share, I think, the second round table here at the ECPR General Conferences. I thought the title is written on here because the title, I believe, has some dynamite in it. It says, we are now talking about cosmopolitan metropolis and parochial hinterlands, a new social cleavage. So we are told there are hinterlands, and the hinterlands, there are parochials. On the other side, there are cities, and the cities, there are cosmopolitans. Well, there are some good people, some bad people, and then we read in the program, we have Trump, we have Brexit. Is it a fault of the bad people in the hinterlands who are parochials? I think the topic is high, high, hot, and I really hope we have in the coming 90 minutes a very interesting and hopefully also contested uh, discussion about what is happening here with this, also a question, new social cleavage we are witnessing here. Let me say some words, a few words about the procedure. We are starting with an introductory statement of the panelists. I will introduce them briefly. And after that, we have a small, small, small little break because the technique has to sort out that from standing here, we are then being a proper round table sitting at chairs. And then we have an internal discussion on the table, without a table, but we'll manage. <laughs> and I will take care that we have at least 30 minutes to open up the discussion uh, to the public. Now, the main protagonists are sitting here to my right, and I start from the very right, so the left hand from your side perspective. This is uh, Reinhard Heinisch. He's a full professor at the University of Salzburg in Austria, PhD from Michigan State University, and he previously hold a professorship at Pittsburgh University in the States. And his research focuses is on comparative politics, labor market policy, and populism. Then, next to him is Sarah De Lange. She holds a chair at the Department of Political Science at the University of Amsterdam, has a PhD from the University of Antwerp, and several uh, been PI of several large projects in the uh, uh, context of the topic we are discussing here. And her research projects are very broad. Of course, populism, but also party families, political conflict, the potential, the political role of the media. Then we have Selin Erlam Aitac. He is assistant uh, professor in the Department of International Relations at Koch University Istanbul. He received his PhD from Yale University and was already awarded several uh, prizes for his scientific achievements. His interest is focused on political behavior with a focus on democratic accountability and political participation. Then, that's what one always says, last but not least, we have Radislav Markovsky. He is a chair of the Center for the Study of Democracy at Warsaw University, Poland, and a director of Polish National Election Studies since 1995, and since 1997 also a member of the planning committee of the Comparative Study of Electoral Systems programs, producing data which we all, or all of, many of us use, and how we're grateful and thankful that we have that data so at that point. And his focus is on a, a very wide range of uh, comparative politics and, uh, of course, electoral studies. Now I will ask, in the order I represented the, the uh, panel participants to come up here, give uh, introductory statements about evidence, the, the main interpretations, the discussions in, in the fields of five to ten minutes, and then 
we will start the discussion of at the round table. Thank you very much for the introduction, for the invitation. Thank you for your um, kind interest. So let me, um, when we were asked uh, to, when we were asked to um, to participate in this roundtable, if I get this to work here, I mean the question we're supposed to address is where what explains the establishment of. Um, populist parties and what explains their persistence, what explains the push towards populism and democratic regression. And obviously, if we, many of you know, uh, if we look at the, there is a number of, of, of theories and expandatory frameworks that are currently um, discussed. And uh, in fact, uh, if I put in a plug for, for Hawkins, Kaltwasser, Carl and Lynn Litway, they are presenting actually a uh, major work and another roundtable in a few days. And all these are probably wonderful explanations that allow us to explain and allow us to, to shed light on uh, any of these questions. However, I would like to take this opportunity to focus on the question, the, the idea of the, the image of the metropolis and the parochial hinterlands and share with you some insights from the last Austrian national elections and don't draw some general conclusions. So I'll be talking about the Austrian Freedom Party, and I'd like to um, discuss the idea of the metropolis versus the parochial hinterland. So it suggests, so we're being suggested both the topic here, but also the, the narrative on the demand side suggests the story is about um, a, a, an enlightened urban metropole facing a parochial hinterland that's culturally rural, remote, and traditional, thinking sort of West Texas or Louisiana, sort of. And of course, there's plenty of evidence if we looked at um, of national election data that we seemingly see a polarized cleavage population. This is from a slide from the Austrian national election, and it shows where people vote for the conservative and the far right, and where foreign residents are concentrated. And you can see these are really two polar opposites. Or I can show you a slide from the Austrian presidential election from 2016, and you could, where you had a Green Party candidate and a Freedom Party candidate, and you see the country, the map, a sea of blue indicating the color of the Freedom Party surrounding tiny islands of green, which are in part the urban areas where the green voters were, and in the end the green candidate won that election. But it seems to also suggest a highly polarized cleavage society, the countryside on one end and the cities on the other. But when we look a little bit more closely, it gets a little bit more complicated because way out in the west of Austria, which is also very rural, I mean, not very urban in that sense, we, have, uh, we see significant voting for the green candidate. And on the other hand, we see in and around some of the metropolitan area, uh, heavy voting for the far right. These are people who live in the excerpts and suburbs and people who uh, work in the cities and yet they seem to be voting for the uh, for the freedom party if we then move on and look at um, the look at the share of the party vote in urban areas versus rural areas so we see that the liberal party the green party and the social democrats do well in the urban areas and they don't do so well in rural areas. The further rural it gets, the less, the worse they perform. And that's sort of what we expect. If we look at the conservative party, the other, it's the opposite. They do well, not so well in the cities, but do much better in, in the countryside. But when we then look at the Freedom Party, the far right, interestingly, what we see is they don't do as well as some in the metropole, they don't do as well as some in the rural areas, but they do pretty well overall, but they do especially well in this middle ground. So we can say there's sort of a contested, a contested space, a contested socioculturally, territorially contested space in the middle where they do rather well. If we then look at voter groups, we find that yes, um, parochial voters, in this case the working class, voted heavily for the Freedom Party. Academics do not vote not for the Freedom Party. But then if we vote for the, if we look at the second most highly educated group, or if we look at women, or if we look at uh, um, people under, uh, voters under 29, we see there was significant voting for 
the Freedom Party. And these are not just voters that live in the parochial hinterland. We can also look at it differently. We can see we divide up the electorate, whether they live in rural areas, in towns, or in the metropolitan areas. And we see that in rural, small towns and rural areas, the Conservative Party comes in first. And as expected, in the, in the metropolis, the Social Democrats come in first. But what we also notice is that the Freedom Party, the radical right, comes in second in each of those areas. This suggests very strongly that their strength is not concentrated in a rural area, but is concentrated by being able to play both sides, being in the middle, uh, taking up the sociocultural center ground and moving, and then tapping into both the, the, the metropolis and the rural area. So the lessons, the first set of lessons I draw on the demand side is the parochial hinterland is not necessarily rural, is not necessarily remote, is not necessarily traditional. Uh, there's a contested middle ground, both socioculturally and geographically, and it's a medium and small town, the suburbs, the excerpts. And the strength of the Freedom Party in this middle ground gives them the capacity of reaching into the metropole and the rural areas. This brings us to the supply side. Sort of what makes, in what ways, is the Freedom Party able to tap into that middle ground? I suggest what we see is uh, it makes, it has a tremendous programmatic appeal. And the programmatic appeal is, that, is a two-fold kind of, two appeal. It's a center periphery narrative that is offered, and it's a community narrative that is offered. The center periphery narrative is the argument um, that there are national elites, there's an unwillingness of the national elites to recognize, understand, and consider the specific needs of the specific local needs. And they address people, voters, always as voters of a certain area. So the good people in the populist diction are the good people of a region versus the national international elite. And the second is an emotional appeal. The German word, the Heimat, the idea, it's an emotional signifier, a place, everybody has a Heimat. It's, not a, it's like the heartland. It doesn't exist anywhere in particular, but it exists everywhere. And it, it conjures up the idea of a community will feel warm and safe, as Sigmund Baumann called it. But these are the two programmatic appeals they're very good at. But they also have a, an organizational appeal because they have tremendous organizational presence. If you look at the Austrian Freedom Party, it has some 200 uh, regional headquarters and 1,200, 1,248 local chapters, so it gives a tremendous reach, vertical and, or, uh, vertical and horizontal scope. And so let me come to the conclusion. Uh, the conclusions would be, first of all, the focus on the metro, metro, metropolis versus the hinterland cleavage may overshadow the strength that radical right-wing parties have in the contested middle ground. Secondly, it enables the radical right to tap into metropolitan and rural areas. Thirdly, um, they make a locational and an emotional programmatic appeal, center periphery and communal appeal. Uh, fourthly, the, there's an organizational presence um, leading to translating to grassroots activism. And finally, um, other parties are clearly guilty of having neglected both programmatically and organizationally key demographic groups. So there is a territoriality, if you will, to the populist appeal where they speak to people outside the metropolis. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to uh, address uh, this uh, idea that I think has become especially quite popular in the media. Uh, you see a lot of media reporting about uh, an opposition that has emerged between cosmopolitan citizens in uh, the larger cities and uh, citizens in the rural areas that are more nationalist, more authoritarian uh, in nature. Like uh, Reinhardt, I'm a bit skeptical about whether this really constitutes a new social cleavage. First of all, I think we have to recognize that uh, when we try to account for the emergence of both radical right-wing populist parties and green parties, that there's many different social oppositions that play a role, and that often these oppositions are interacting and cross-cutting. Um, we know that age is a factor in explaining the support for these parties. We know that gender is, we know that education is, and yes, uh, urbanity and rurality, uh, location where one lives is a factor as well. Uh, and I think it's the combination of 
different factors that identify whether citizens see themselves as what Goodhart calls anywheres or somewheres. Citizens that are bound to a certain location and therefore have to deal with all the societal challenges that co are coming at them, and citizens that see themselves as very mobile and have much more the impression that they can profit from these challenges because they can easily adjust to it, for example, by relocating and following opportunities. I also think that we tend to forget what a cleavage in the classic sense of Lipson, Set and Rocken actually means. It means more than a simple opposition in society. It means the existence of su such an opposition, which results in political organization on the basis of that opposition, but which also entails a sense of self-identification with the opposition and with the group to which one belongs. And I think we're missing that point very often. First, we thought that the rise of these parties was the result of an education cleavage. It was the higher educated versus the lower educated. But if you look in society, these are ne not necessarily terms that citizens themselves use to describe themselves, not in the same way that they used to use, for example, class for many decades. And I think uh, this also disregards the fact that compared to the days of Lipset and Rocken, parties have a lot of agency in shaping societal cleavages and determining which cleavages become politically relevant and which not. And I think that Reinhardt gave a couple of very nice examples of where we see that the parties that we're studying are actually actively sh mobilizing and shaping the opposition uh, that we're discussing. Instead of a new social cleavage, I think it's more productive to think about how we can understand patterns of variation in support of these parties that are somehow geographical in nature. Because these patterns are clearly there. Reinhardt showed a map of Austria in which we saw that the FPO does better in some areas than in others and the Green do some better in some other areas than others as well. But when we look at these variations, I think it's very important to realize that first of all, the variation within urban areas and the variation within rural areas is as large as that between the two kinds of areas. There's a massive amount of variation. And the variation does not only exist at the regional level, the level that we tend to talk about at the moment, parties doing better in Eastern Germany than in Western Euro Germany, for example, parties doing better in the Northeast and the Southeast of France than in the West of France, but the variation exists at the level of the neighborhood, at the level of the municipality, and at the level of the region. So these are quite complex patterns of variation that need to be accounted for at all these different levels. Let me give you an example from the Netherlands. Uh, in a large European project that we're working on together with universities of Germany, uh, France and UK, we've studied these neighborhood and municipal levels of variation. And if you look at the data of statistics in the Netherlands, uh, this is the map of the support for the P PVV in the Netherlands in terms of propensity to vote. So it's not necessarily what citizens have voted in the last elections, because of that, of course, that fluctuates quite a bit. This is the general support for the PVV in the Netherlands. And then you see indeed, for example, that the PVV is quite successful here in the southeast of the Netherlands, quite a rural area, and also in some areas uh, close to the German border. But you also see that they're equally successful in some particular Western areas. For example, the area where there is a lot of uh, greenhouse gardening, the Westland, uh, or areas in uh, the northeast, northwest of the Netherlands. And this is illustrated if we look at the so-called metropolises. Uh, the three largest cities in the Netherlands are Amsterdam, The Hague and Rotterdam. Amsterdam is the capital city in which the PVV scores very low, 6.8% in the last elections. The Hague and Rotterdam are actually large cities with large levels, high levels of diversity, a lot of immigration, where the PVV does really well, 15.4% and 15.7% uh, in the last elections. 
And this raises questions about how we can actually explain the differences between the cities rather than how we can explain the differences between the urban and the rural countryside. One of the striking observations that I see across Europe when I look at election results is the fact that the radical right-wing populist parties are extremely successful in big harbor cities. Antwerp, Rotterdam, Marseille, uh, if you think back to the Shield Party here in uh, Hamburg, there is something specific about these cities, about maybe the composition of their population, about their context, that make them very good havens for these parties. But even at a lower level, Amsterdam is not a good place for the PVV to campaign. But if you look at the distribution of the different neighborhoods of Amsterdam, and these are data from uh, Research and Statistics Amsterdam, there is actually five different neighborhoods in Amsterdam, in the north, in the west and the southeast, where the PVV is the largest party in the last uh, national elections. So again, these distributions at municipal level actually cover large variations at a lower level. I think to understand these patterns of variation, we need to look past simple and conventional explanations. Um, here you see the map of uh, Germany and of France, where not only the support uh, for uh, the radical right is uh, depicted in terms of color, but with the shading and the patterning, we also see percentage of foreign-born uh, population, percentage unemployed, and areas that have a combination of both these general challenges that are seen as fertile ground for radical right-wing populist parties. Now, the match between these different factors is far from perfect. And I think we need better explanations for our variation. And I want to just give just a couple of ideas that I think we need to take into consideration. I think we need to think more, more about the complex interactions that take place between context and attitudes. So how do co does context actually impact on citizens' perceptions of their situation and hence their attitudes towards certain political topics? I think we also need to take into consideration the idea of equifinality. We have a tendency to look for the explanation for support for a particular kind of party. What we found in our own project is that very different factors, context factors, impact on different attitudes in urban areas on the one hand and rural areas on the other. So there's two different paths that lead to support for radical right-wing populist parties. And I think that we also need to take into consideration all kinds of different sociological processes, such as sorting. So we know that citizens have a tendency to move to areas with like-minded people. Uh, we know that there's phenomena like white flight. Now, these also impact on the way we think about how context shapes uh, uh, the support for these parties. The same goes, of course, for halo effects. The fact that it might actually be that, be that you're living relatively close to an area with migrants or unemployment and you fear that development is having an impact on your behavior. I'll just leave you with the general findings of our project, which were that there's two different paths to the radical, populist radical right. And perhaps there's so, therefore also two different paths to green parties and social liberal parties. We found that immigration and changes in the level of immigration impact on citizens' attitudes about nativism in urban areas. And that, that explains the support for populist radical right parties. In urban areas, where the levels of migration are generally below a certain threshold, we found a very different pattern. We found that social deprivation and um, social decline, for example, by the fact that there's a lot of out-migration out of an area by young citizens who don't see a future, or the fact that a lot of social services are being closed, think about schools, banks, all kinds of other daily facilities, that those impact on the attitudes that um, Reinhardt also mentions, namely feelings of political discontent, political alienation from the center, and therefore lead to support for populist radical right parties. 
So I hope that we can together discuss the more complex theories that we need rather than discuss whether there is a cleavage or not. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, organizing this panel and having me here. Uh, today I want to briefly talk about recent research that I have done um, uh, in Turkey uh, at, Koch, with, at colleagues with Koch University, at Koch University. And as this full room uh, can attest to, there has been a growing interest in understanding the individual level determinants of support for populism. And we have done some research in that direction in Turkey. So uh, when you look at uh, studies about individual level drivers of populism, you see discontent as the key driver, right? It might be dissatisfaction with the economy. It might be dissatisfaction with how the society has been transforming as a, like a cultural backlash or one's, with one's place in society or uh, how democracy works, etc. Uh, I mean, this cleavage that we have been talking about in this roundtable could be seen as an expression of that discontent as well. But when you look at the cases, most of the research on these uh, drivers of populism are from contexts where populist parties in power. I mean, this kind of uh, context versus explanation decks the favor, uh, decks the stack in favor of explanations that. Uh, point to dissatisfaction because opposition-minded individuals are more likely to be dissatisfied with the uh, econo uh, with the democratic uh, with the system in any way. So our question is that would we observe a similar dynamic of support for uh, populism in a context where there has been a populist party in power for a long time? So therefore, we turn to Turkey as a context where we argued. I mean, we argued that the AKP. Uh, in power since 2002, has been uh, campaigning on a uh, populist platform heavily. And we basically draw on a national representative sample uh, that includes questions about support for populism. Our results point to the, con our results point to the uh, observation that individuals, gender, age, education level, income, some of the factors that actually Sarah mentioned, do not have any discernible effects on support for populism in Turkey. And also this uh, metropolitan versus hinterland argument does not work as well. So instead, we see that support for populism is heavily influenced by partisanship, so that the partisans of the ruling AKP are, have significantly higher levels of populist attitudes than the rest. And maybe more, in, more interestingly, the populists are also more satisfied with, more satisfied with their lives, with, the economic, with their economic circumstances, and with how the democracy works in the country. So they are not dissatisfied, they are actually more satisfied than other individuals. And when we look at different dimensions of populism, these people score higher on dimensions of centrality of people's will and disdain for institutions of horizontal accountability. So that is, they extol people's will as the central expression of politics, and they see institutions of horizontal accountability, such as the courts, a strong, uh, a strong legislator, as merely impediments to the exercise uh, of people's will by the governing party. So, and these observations are also, maybe unsurprisingly, in line with the AKP leadership's discourse. When you look at their, how they talk about the politics, they basically uh, extol the ballot box, they have a very negative view of the institutions of horizontal accountability. So what can we make of these uh, results? I mean, we argue that, of course, these observations are linked, in, the, in a sense that uh, since there has been a party with a populist platform uh, long in power, supporters of this party seems to have internalized the core premises uh, of populism. And as their preferred party keeps winning the elections, they are more satisfied than others uh, in terms of economy, their lives, about how the politics work, etc. The implications, I think, we think are interesting for other cases as well, because they suggest that Unlike emphasized in, very, very much emphasized in the literature, support for populism does not need to be grounded in deep discontent. Instead, populism can also be very prevalent in a society, even if the resentments that have uh, brought the populist party in power have long disappeared. So the conditions are that then the role of elite discourse. So if the elites keep pushing a populist rhetoric, keep push a populist agenda, then there is no need to be 
a dissatisfied constituency to have a populist constituency, basically. So even if those resentments are gone, populism can continue. So bombarded with populist messages and discourse, uh, the constituency of the populist party seems to have uh, internalized the core principles of populism. And uh, in a very, again, follow-up to this research, we have also conducted a survey experiment where basically we have manipulated the source of populist messages. Uh, in one case, for example, the leader of the AKP gives some populist messages. In other case, leader of the opposition. And in, in a third case, a neutral source uh, makes different statements. And also in that research, we see that it is possible to manipulate the populist attitudes of people with partisan skew. So if uh, AKP partisans sees that the leader of AKP, Erdogan, makes some populist statements, they are even further, uh, they, they, they show even further populist attitudes. And interestingly, for example, the supporters of the opposition party display lower levels of uh, populist attitudes. So, uh, to conclude, then I would say the role of the elites, the media, in perpetuating these uh, populist messages seems to be important whether we observe support for populism or not, irrespective of the actual resentments of people in society. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, unfortunately, I'm the one who did not prepare anything. We, first of all, for probably two reasons. One is uh, I am from a periphery. Uh, secondly, uh, round tables in Poland currently uh, being so criticized by the democratic new forces that are in power in Poland have uh, criticized round tables for many. It's, it's considered to be a treason these days. Nevertheless, uh, when let me remind you of the Polish round table of 1989. Uh, those who came to this round table were desperate to arrive at a socialism with a human face. That's what it was about. A little bit more liberalism, a little bit more of freedom. And in two months from then on, we ended up in an election that swept out the communists from Poland and from the region. I'm not insisting that this round table also <laughs> ends up in some kind of revolutionary ideas, but, but let, let me uh, start with a with few things that are rather methodological and problematic for me and not uh, bore you with, uh, I can titulate you, of course, with the Polish uh, uh, developments these days. They, they are really interesting. Uh, part of the story is exactly what you mentioned just uh, before, that this kind of uh, uh, populist uh, or democratic backlashes happens in increasingly in countries where there is no crisis. It was a country with an enormous success and dynamic development unmet by other regional standards. But my major point is, uh, uh, first of all, that in this introductory page, uh, well, I was both involved in studying cleavages. I was desperate to find cleavages in Central and Eastern Europe for almost 25 years. Unfortunately, we were close to that in Hungary by 2000s. They had a single-digit volatility at the time. Unfortunately, it disappeared. Um, I organized, actually, at ECPR sessions twice in Edinburgh with Hans-Dieter Klingemann, a, a panel on cleavages, causes and consequences, and two or three years ago in Warsaw, another one. So, uh, well, the bad news is, I think, at least in Central and Eastern Europe, at least in my uh, life expectancy, I, I don't think I'll find cleavages in Central and Eastern Europe, cleavages proper, right? Rokanian, stable, transgenerational thing. This is about the ontology of time. I mean, let's not <laughs> confuse cleavages with all kinds of conflicts, oppositions, quarrels and the like. Cleavages are serious things. This is something that happens uh, across decades. You have to prove that there is no volatility, that there is encapsulation, Bartolini, Mare, or whatever. This kind of language can be attributed to cleavages. Otherwise, of course, there are all kinds of conflicts around. And uh, uh, with the kind of volatility we have in Central and Eastern Europe, just forget it. It's, it, and even you don't have to go into in block, uh, between block volatility. Just look at gen general volatility, and you will find that uh, uh, there is no reason uh, to talk 
about cleavages. That, that, that's the first point. The second point is, uh, with this um, parochial hinterlands and uh, uh, cosmopolitan metropolitan areas, uh, uh, again, if I were to look at the region, and in Poland in particular, uh, the data at my disposal don't allow me to say anything, uh, really, that would be uh, seriously confirmed by empirical data. Part of the problem is that in a country with a turnout at parliamentary elections that uh, very rarely exceeds 50%, for instance, aggregate level uh, analysis is just uh, garbage, right? I mean, you, you cannot uh, 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 use uh, this kind of data to arrive at uh, um, serious uh, conclusions. So, um, to make it clear, um, the problem we have with cleavages these days is also, and in particular in an area like Central and Eastern Europe, where, let me remind you, at the beginning of the 90s, uh, uh, in most countries of the region, almost everybody was employed by the state. Poland and Hungary were a little bit of an exception with few people working in the private sector. So what we had in the region for at least two decades was enormous uh, change in uh, what sociologists call social status of individuals. Not the groups, they themselves change, right? The localities did change. The Polish uh, agricultural uh, uh, population dropped down from uh, almost 30% in the 1990s to uh, about 10% today. So these are uh, enormously uh, important uh, uh, changes on the side of uh, uh, the, the social part, the social group. So uh, today, if we would like to say something and trace uh, chase cleavages, uh, then the problem is twofold. First of all, on the side of sociology, we would have to ask our sociologists to tell us uh, seriously whether this class strata narrative is still valid. Do people really, is the internal homogeneity of the classical approach uh, still uh, reasonable or should we look for other uh, type of aggregation on that left-hand side of the equation? And then comes the right-hand side of the equation in the Polish national election study a few years ago, we did try to ask people about political representation, whether they feel represented by political parties or other institutions. And it turned out that Poles, that these are strange characters generally, but, uh, 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 you know, uh, they seem to be much more uh, inclined to trust in media outlets, in journalists. And I assure you that in a country like Poland, if you are a representative or supporter of a software party which is you know seven percent strong in a parliament probably much more influential could be a, a, a powerful uh, tv station or a newspaper or a weekly in forcing the government to introduce certain policies than an oppositional party so i would say on the side of of the who are to represent us we have to do uh, 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 a lot uh, as well uh, how much do I have? Yeah, okay. Uh, very briefly, let me leave something for the discussion. Uh, um, uh, maybe um, on populism. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, I'm sorry for repeating myself, but uh, I think this basket will explode soon. I mean, the, 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 everything that is un undemocratic, anti liberal, somehow nasty to democracy is, is populism. Now, we have to. We have to uh, have some order in the basket. Uh, at least uh, uh, in Poland, I, I, I don't see it's populism. Yes, there are certain ingredients of populism, like uh, uh, disrespect for institutions, like uh, other things, uh, overbidding in elections, and so on and so forth. But I'm inclined either to call it uh, authoritarian clientelism, which is the name of the game, or recently I'm working on a idea that it is about something that is uh, still not clear to me uh, uh, what kind of status this concept has, but simplicis. It's simply, you know, the, the, the narrative between the elites and the masses is based on a kind of 
simplistic narrative. It's not about the elites that are corrupted or bankrupt or otherwise um, unfair to the people. It is uh, that uh, the world seems to be much more simpler than those intellectuals, university professors and others. They make uh, the world complicated by their narratives, by their na language. So the, the, the linkage between the Polish, let me just for the sake of simplicity say, <laughs> uh, that uh, these Polish populists are using this simple language, uh, and it is very effective. Uh, uh, they, they have pursued it, and also you can see it in Trump's narratives, etc., etc. Finally, um, uh, yeah, there is this Polish case, um, as I've already mentioned, I don't think this uh, in the literature on populism, in many instances, or even typically, you have these expectations that populists pop up when the crisis is around. Well, not anymore, I think. There are many instances in which a success is the name of the game. In Poland, and had I had more time, I would have elaborated on it. I, I also think that uh, in this particular Catholic culture with strong belief in miracles, you know, uh, uh, this EU funds, structural funds, that like an avalanche came to the Polish countryside, uh, made people, well, it, it's fantastic. We have nice roads, there are schools, there are kindergartens, and all. but the mentality of the people, this was another in, input into their belief that miracles happen, you know? <laughs> and when a party like peace comes to an electoral contest and promises more and more and more, they say, yeah, that's it. It is possible. So you know in the western part of this continent that uh, in order to become affluent, responsible, and so on and so forth, you know, generations are needed. These guys got it in, in you know, five to ten years. I'm happy they got it, but the socializational effect of that is uh, along the lines what William Ogburn a century ago had in his hypothesis of the cultural lack theory, I think. Um, and finally, populism, as uh, we know from empirical studies, is a very dormant concept. Yeah? It's, it's, uh, if you look at most European countries, the mean of populism in each country is very, very, it differs very little. The standard deviations is very low. But in some countries, populists are very strong, and in some, they virtually are virtually non-existent. It drives our attention then to the context, right? In some contexts, and this is the important thing about populists, in some contexts, populist parties become successful, in some they don't. And finally, uh, well, uh, only now, in two countries, if we are tolerant, we could say that populists are in power. So far, we haven't seen a country in Europe run by populists. So we don't know exactly what it means in terms of long-term effects. Again, back to ontology of time, and the time is needed. Sorry for being too long, but that's it. Thank you. I have one question, and then we immediately, I think, uh, open up for the discussion. The subtitle of this roundtable was A New Cleavage. Question mark. Did I understand you all, I think, said it more or less explicit? The answer is a clear no. There is no new cleavage, but just a pretty much variation within towns and rural areas and lots of possible explanations for voting for populism or simplicist parties, as I learned. I, I, I got to think about it. That's a quite interesting new... Um, concept to would you you're all nodding yeah. then I then I think you you were the first to have a question then uh, is that all yeah. okay <clears throat> would you always briefly introduce you, you and much. also say whether the question is to all of us or yeah, to someone comment um, my name is Monica de Franz I work on urban politics for, uh, between urban studies and political science. I'm currently visiting professor in, at Charles University and worked for many years also at the EUI Florence. Um, I'm uh, 
I would agree, there is no new urban rural cleavage. Uh, the problem is that probably it's not easy to def identify urban areas in statistics or even on maps. In urban studies, uh, there is a whole discussion about whatever is the definition even of cities nowadays, as we have urbanization, transnational networks, complex spaces. So, uh, and urban comes close to somehow transnational connections and place politics. Um, and so we have new functional and symbolic aspects of politics as nation states are not anymore the, the only political containers. So uh, the issue is that I think that urban is defined also by diversity and complexity. And so we have all kinds of functional and symbolic aspects uh, that also offer new, a lot of uh, opportunities for populist interpretation from cosmopolitanism, which is a large concept to regions versus the capital cities with different meanings in the UK or in Austria or wherever. And uh, then there is also the right to the city idea that is the left version of uh, a movement about urbanism and now we also have the EU urban agenda and the United Nations urban agenda that is kind of coming from the top down as a transnational uh, move uh, governance attempt to deal with complexity and basically to open up political processes um, so I would say uh, urban is, cannot be a cleavage, a fixed cleavage, because it's in itself open-ended, and it's the end, maybe the end of cleavages, if urban has any um, role in politics. Thank you. Is there hopefully a question? Uh, well, thanks very much for the presentations. My name is Jeremia Stadelmeier from the University of Vienna. I just have a very brief question, might be to the whole audience, uh, to the whole um, uh, roundtable. Uh, how does age matter for this non-cleavage? Like, uh, coming from Austria, I know that uh, voting decisions differ a lot for different age cohorts, and I was wondering whether this urban-rural divide might also matter differently for different age groups. Thank you. Thank you. Who wants to start? Well, the, 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 the difficult thing, I think, is that age doesn't op operate in the same way in every country. Uh, so the, the effect of age in the UK is actually different from that in the Netherlands or perhaps that in Austria. Um, it's and this is also it's more clearly uh, defined for one pole of the, the the cleavage we're discussing. So it's very clear that, for example, green parties and also to some extent social liberal parties are more popular under younger voters. Uh, but for radical right wing populist parties, it's actually less clear because there's different age groups, both younger voters and older voters, that feel attracted to these parties. Uh, whereas the middle groups are underrepresented. Now, I think there is some reason to think that um, there is interaction between these two in this question, because we do find in our study um, that uh, out migration of young citizens contributes to this phenomenon. And that by definition means that you on average have an older population left uh, in these areas. Yeah, there's, there's sort of two answers at two different levels. I mean, it, it's sort of very country and party system specific. I mean, in Austria, you have the phenomenon that you have older voters which have formed lasting ties to established parties and these ties survive the populist challenge. So you have all the social democrats keep voting for the social democrats. So, and you need to actually break that tie before voters become eligible 
or mobilizable for the populace. So in some ways, age is a barrier, and younger people can be recruited more quickly, but doesn't mean that young people are more prone to vote for them, but they're more readily recruitable. So it depends on how the parties then approach this. But if Pippa Norris was sitting here, and I don't want to put words in it, she would certainly, but there's a whole approach out there that argues that age cohort is driving this, and you see value changes that connect to value shift that connect to generations, and it's a generational shift, so you have a younger generation propagating liberal values to which an older generation reacts. So that's a different explanation out there. I don't want to be the judge of that, but that is certainly a way in which age would come in. Just to add to the last point, the question there is also whether younger and older citizens have different attitudes or whether they find different issues more important. So it could be very well also the case that older voters simply care more about traditional socioeconomic issues, whereas younger voters care more about non-material cultural issues, but are very much divided on these issues based on uh, education and other kinds of factors. Okay. There's a question. There must be, I'm sure, lots of people here in this room who are actually writing on papers on the rural-urban divide. Are we all accepting that, that this cleavage is gone and done? So I would be, yeah, I'll just uh, entertain you until the micro is here. <laughs> I don't have a question about that at all. Um, but I have a, but, oh, sorry, did you have a, yeah, Did I interrupt you? Oh, I, it was very quickly. Um, sorry. The, 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 about the, you intrigued me about the Turkish, the Turkish case, because to be per perfectly honest, I was never convinced that that um, the Turkish case was about populism, um, but you kind of halfway convinced me that maybe it is. And very quickly, um, if there's a people-centered um, um, discourse there, is there also an anti-elite discourse in, in, in the Turkish case of populism? Uh, yes, I mean, that's a very relevant question because, I mean, who are the elites, right? Oh, I think he has a follow-up. Yeah, my my a follow question actually follows directly up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, Jörn Grevingold, German Development Institute. Uh, it was fantastic presentations, and after the first two, uh, I had to part from my understanding, okay, it's, there's a cleavage, okay, I accepted that, then I put my hope on the dissatisfaction issue, and then Selim came and said, no, it's not dissatisfaction. But thinking about it again, I'm not exactly sure, because, I mean, what you argued, in fact, understood you correctly, was uh, it's not dissatisfaction with the powers that be. But doesn't it exclude, does this exclude that there can be dissatisfaction with the system that you lived through, that you saw working, and that you're not, uh, you not convinced was working in your favor? That is, the previous system, which, which is the reason why you're satisfied with what you get, with what you got, and what you have now. But it doesn't mean that there is not dissatisfaction with a certain type of system, maybe even a certain value system, a certain normative system, and a certain way of how your position as a country, as a society in the world is being perceived. And all this is being fueled by the AKP. So maybe there is dissatisfaction, but not with my immediate economic situation, but with something more less tangible. Uh -huh. oh. Thank you very much. I mean, very relevant and interrelated question. So, I mean, the questions are relevant because AKP has been in power for, I don't know how many years, six, 17 years. So they are the elites, right? So how can you make anti-establishment appeals? I mean, Erdogan does it. And I, t I like the definition of Robert Barr in terms of populism. Like he says, uh, outsider, uh, populist leader should be, uh, an outsider should make anti-establishment appeals and should use plebiscitarian linkages so that like they don't like horizontal accountability, they like referendums, they like elections. When you look at the discourse of Erdogan from the start, he basically fits to that pattern. And the first elites were like the military, the bureaucracy, which was more coming from the secular institutions, uh, the judiciary, which was mainly very secular, uh, very isolated from electoral pressure. I mean, Turkey was a tutel military tutelage to start with, right? But then he, of course, I mean, I think that's very interesting. And then he, of course, basically destroyed those institutions or captured them, right? The military, the judiciary. And now he is making new enemies, new elites. 
right, which are the IMF, the US, the European Union, right? Uh, Germany doesn't want Turkey to develop. And then we have those intellectual academics within Turkey who are still uh, in line with these European institutions, et cetera, et cetera, the media. So he keeps finding new elites and he's very uh, tactful in behaving as if he's still struggling to get power. So I think that's, uh, that's my question, the sec my, my answer. The second question, I think you are right in the sense that maybe people are afraid that if Erdogan loses power, they would lose some of the uh, rights that they have enjoyed. Right? Religious people, for example, they have really, uh, they now really have more rights uh, religion is more public in the society, etc., more visible. That might be one issue. But, I mean, I, I was still puzzled that, I mean, you might not expect them maybe necessarily to extol populist values, right? Why do, do they do that? So I think here the elite rhetoric comes into play because they have been bombarded with such rhetoric so that these institutions of horizontal accountability, why do we need them, right? I, you have elected me, I'm doing fine, and then we don't need them, basically. And since he has captured them now, those institutions, he ha has to find new enemies. Um, so at the end of the day, those people are not dissatisfied as you would see from other cases, populism in opposition. But I think you are right. There might be another mechanism where they fear that if AKP loses power, things will go back to the, where it was before that. Thank you. Now of two. Hopefully now we have a defender of the cleavage. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Jonathan. So I from uh, Amsterdam. I'm not going to defend cleavages, but I am going to. Uh, ask a set of interrelated questions that probe uh, what the, uh, the very interesting panelists had to say about that. And they really revolve around two dimensions. One is the historical dimension, and the other is the, the role of parties and their strategies and their relative success. So the, the, the historical question is, uh, one of the things that I heard is, uh, cleavages aren't what they used to be. And there, there's a risk of caricaturing uh, the cleavages that we saw in the past. I mean, let's take the UK, classic um, cleavage, uh, socio, social class-based political cleavages. At their height in the mid-20th century, uh, a third of working class people voted for the conservative party. So it was never a perfect cleavage. And secondly, the extent to which um, voting varied by class depended on how relatively successful parties were in any given election. The more successful the conservatives were, the less the electorate appeared to be polarized uh, by social class. And I think that may have some uh, messages also for our interpretation today. One thing I did hear is that um, uh, there certainly are uh, observable but uh, shifting uh, socio-political and geographic divisions, very marked divisions within the electorate. They vary across countries and they shift over time. I mean, uh, Sarah's uh, final slide says, okay, there are two mechanisms for support in the Netherlands for right-wing populist parties, and one of them uh, works uh, is specific to rural or, let's say, peripheral deindustrializing uh, regions. That seems quite uh, an important uh, partial counter to the idea that we are not seeing anything like potential cleavages. And then that brings me to the last point, which is, um, so I'm, I'm suggesting parties always mattered. Parties always had agency, even in the, uh, the old uh, cleavages. The more successful a right-wing populist party is, by definition, the more they will break through to voters beyond their original cores. And so that may also be something that we're seeing uh, in the very interesting 
uh, case of the um, uh, the FPÖ uh, in uh, in Austria. So that that suggests maybe we shouldn't completely throw out the the concept of cleavages. And of course, to come back to the last um, speaker, uh, we don't yet know uh, how these patterns may become uh, institutionalized uh, over uh, time. That's something that. Um, you know, we will only know uh, in, a, in another generation. Who wants to answer? So with regard to the first question, you're absolutely right that the relationship between uh, being on one or the other side of a social cleavage was never uh, perfect. Uh, in terms of, of political behavior, in terms of voting behavior. But I think what was stronger in the days of Lipset and Rocken is, first of all, the self-identification as in terms of belonging to a certain group. Uh, and second, the broader political organization around that identity uh, in terms of all kinds of political organizations, which we, we no longer see. I actually think that for, for some time we thought we were seeing something like that around education, at, at least in the Netherlands you did not only uh, observe differences in voting behavior and, and political attitudes on the basis of education, but you, for example, also saw the emergence of societal actors, um, insurance companies, uh, uh, dating organizations that uh, marketed themselves as being for higher educated citizens, for example. So I think there was something emerging there that was not th yet there yet before. At least in the Netherlands, I don't think we have the same uh, in terms of urban and rural division. But of course, the Netherlands is a country that historically never had an urban rural cleavage. So in countries where that cleavage had always been present, it might be quite different. Um, and uh, yes, parties always diversify when they grow beyond a certain uh, percentage of, of supporters, the electorate becomes more heterogeneous. But the question is, of course, which groups then uh, are the ones that are being attracted uh, as the new uh, groups in terms of broadening also a programmatic appeal? Yeah, I, thank you very much. On, on one level, the criticism, the criticism that we would, I guess, level at the argument there is a cleavage, there's a cultural cleavage, and that sort of explains everything, because it's in some ways very apolitical. And I'm glad that you, again, reminded us of the aspect of agency. In other words, the importance uh, of political actors and political entrepreneurs to propose a narrative and a cohesive framework which allows, which then leads to a way of seeing a reality. And I think that's a very important, this construction is very important, it's often forgotten. And I think if we look at the Austrian case, there are areas in Austria where, because populism has existed there for so long, where this is becoming intergenerational, where you can see that that was a realignment that was just a, te a seemingly temporary realignment that took place 20, 30 years ago, but that realignment has led to a permanent natural home of a particular, for a particular party. And the other side, there's always the other side of the medallion in the sense that once a party dominates with the narrative, other parties pull out. So it's a very much an agency-led process. And in many ways, I think, that is something we need to focus on very squarely if we want to explain this. And I think there's a great danger. We, we assume this is sort of pre-given or this is given and somehow um, it's, it's, it's uh, demand-led. I think it's very much a supply-side story. And we, sh we as political science shouldn't fall into the trap again as we did in the 50s to just, um, just return to a, a, a simple um, um, demand-side explanation of a very complex phenomenon. just uh, probably two points. One is um, if we were to really look at stability of political systems and the political and social order, two additional things are to be taken into account. First of all, whether these cleavages, we, we are talking here about this urban-rural, but of course there are 
many different cleavages that can be present. And the essence is whether they are overlapping or they are cross-cutting cleavages. This is the major starting point to, to look at, right? The second point is, uh, it's not old Lazarsfeld, but all along from then, uh, cross-pressures. How people are cross-pressured. And in rural and urban areas, you know, 50, 60 years ago, uh, the pattern was pretty clear. Today, well, oh, I must say, I don't know, but apparently all people are, must be more cross-pressured for the simple reason there is more mobility, there is more access to different media outlets, etc., etc. Previously, the poor peasant was uh, cross-pressured by the 20 or 100 people he saw around him, right? Today, he can be cross-pressured by uh, uh, hundreds of, uh, uh, of media outlets, etc., etc. Uh, second point is, uh, uh, I don't know why I was going to say about it, it will come in a minute. Uh, Herbert Kitchell had a nice study of clientelism around the world, and among the many things that were there, um, he, he used to uh, entertain us with, with his graph on um, uh, how um, clientelistic effort and clientelistic results. And, and one of, of, of his results was that in Latin America, apparently political parties made an enormous clientelistic effort, but the effect of clientelism is so-so. I mean, it doesn't mean that there is no clientelism. It's just the proportion, the, the ratio between the two is low. And in, in trying to find the answer why, the answer was basically, inf it was about intermediary social institutions. Huh? And this is the same precisely what is happening in Poland uh, and Hungary, Hungary uh, in particular, that the success of Orban and Fidesz and in Poland of, of the current government is that they were capable of organizing in Poland accompanied by church, of course. Church is the, the political actor in Poland, right? In Hungary less so, but Orban was capable of organizing active uh, social movements, social uh, infrastructure that supported them. So um, intermediary institutions are uh, enormously important if we were to understand uh, the stability and the vote. And all along in Central and Eastern Europe, save the Czech Republic and a few other places, but in, in Poland and Hungary for, for, for sure, wherever we came close to cleavages, the cleavages were based not on structural uh, um, um, uh, variables and factors, but rather axiological and value orientations. It is in Poland and in Hungary up to a certain point, the total explanatory, uh, the, you can explain the vote only by looking at symbolic, uh, sociocultural, uh, uh, identitarian issues. Economic issues do not matter in vote choice. They are more important for people. But they don't matter in vote choice. So um, this is um, something that we overlooked and uh, of course our idea that politics should be about redistribut uh, redistributive issues alone uh, uh, simply is not, is not true and we, we learned this uh, probably too, too late. There was a question, yeah? Gregor Zunz of the University uh, in Düsseldorf, Heinrich Heine University. Um, you talked about cleavages in society, but what's your perspective on conflicts or tension within single parties, which can clearly be fr framed uh, going between a more cosmopolitan orientation and a more national orientation, linked, for example, to topics like the financial crisis or the refugee crisis or even climate change. Because all these parties are still searching for good working strategies vis-a-vis -vis these new contenders, these populist uh, right parties. Thank you. Who wants to take a lead? Oh, you're the poor one. <laughs> <laughs> Women are brave, really. <laughs> So, so, so just to clarify, you, you mean divisions within mainstream parties, yes. Exactly. Um, well, that depends a bit on the kind of mainstream party, 
in terms of ideological identity, but also in their size, because many of these parties have gotten so small, especially in the case of social uh, democratic parties, that the, the different factions have already split and found homes in new parties. Um, to give an example, also from the Netherlands, so on the basis of the, the same project data that we've analyzed, um, the, the Dutch Social Democrats' labor have, of course, lo lost the vast majority of their support in the last nat national elections. Uh, and voters have spread out almost evenly over all the different other parties uh, in, in the political space. So not only going to green parties, uh, but going, going to social populist parties, social liberal parties, mainstream right parties, and populist radical right parties. And of course, um, that creates some tension in the sense that there is no strategy to gain back all these voters, but it's also such a uh, uh, divisive uh, or so, there's so much diversity in, in, in where voters are going to that parties have to just opt for one strategy. So it also has sort of an harmonizing effect in a strange way, I think. Yeah, I would second that. I mean, if you look at the Austrian case, you have a situation where the dominant issues that divide the, the, within the parties, should they work with the far right? And by working with the far right means should they adopt some of their ideas? Um, but there is also a consolidation effect in the sense since the, 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 the area to the right is already heavily contested, already lots of parties there, why should you also go there? And that's actually keeping them on the other side in some ways, although that debate still is very much going on. Um, and with that is sort of the, the idea how to deal with Islam identity. These are the issues that social democrats. In other cases, you have the splits. Uh, so in Austria, there's the Green Party split, and very much like if you follow the news in Germany, the sort of um, Wagenknecht approach as a politician in Austria makes a similar case, sort of a nationalist leftist party. Um, and, and, and so, so it, it is, uh, it's prying those parties apart, but curiosity, but inter interestingly, it also keeps parties together in a sense because there are few other places to go. Question here in the third row and here in the middle. Oh yeah, and should we maybe have the three questions which I've collected now, and then we have. A, is there are there more questions? Four, five. Oh, a. <laughs> that we make twice three, and uh, we have brief answers on the on the table. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. Sjoska Phillips from uh, Basel University. Um, my question goes into a slightly different uh, um, direction. It's about the political position of academia, if you like. Um, so we have seen academics are part of the voting patterns. So my question to you or whoever would like to answer is, if a populist or you know a simplicist uh, asks you or tells you, uh, you're not only making things you know, simpler than they actually are, but you're also doing so in the service of the hegemonic system that you, know, you, you say you're de deconstructing. What do you tell them? So basically, how do you position academia in our current political environment? There was another question. We collect three now. Or is some, someone closer? So you don't have to... It's coming, it's coming. Thank you. Sigrid Quack, University of Duisburg-Essen. There's one study that hasn't been mentioned from Catherine Kramer, the politics of resentment, rural consciousness, etc. And Catherine, in her wonderful study, makes a very credible claim that in the case of Wisconsin, where she studies uh, the development of public opinion, a kind of collective rural consciousness arises that opposes the countryside to the city. And that description gives the feeling that it's not something situational, but it's kind of generationally transmitted. You might not call it a cleavage, but it comes close to what we think about cleavages. So maybe the question then is not, is there a rural or cosmopolitan or city cleavage, but under what circumstances does a cleavage along these lines arise from the demand and supply side? So I would like to hear from the people on the panel what they think about it. Thank you very much. That was a question I was waiting for. Now, <laughs> I don't, third, I and so. then... <laughs> I don't know. 
the, the closest who wanted to speak should now take the microphone. Well, I have a microphone. <laughs> okay, I have it. All right. <laughs> Got mine. Got it. Um, Kjetil Duval, um, Dalan University. Just a, one thing. Thank you for great presentations and enlightening um, discussion. Um, just one issue that, that, that I thought was sort of missing was... Uh, to some extent, that this, this, the, the, um, the, the rise of this issue is also linked to, at least in the Western European context, to the, to the decline of the, the crisis of social democracy, and, and, and how, to some extent, is linked to, to, to uh, a sort of a, like in, in the U.S. and, and with Brexit, with a, with a, with a post-industrial crisis, and, and uh, a sense in the, in areas that were used to be controlled quite, quite heavily, quite strongly, solidly, by social, social democratic parties, are um, not seen to by, by many of their former voters as to address their issues, that there is a, also a crisis that social democrats in the urban areas tend to be focusing, according to some, too much on, on identity issues, tend to be too cosmopolitan, and forgetting about their rural voters and and yeah i thought that that should also be brought up thank you so three questions brief answers <laughs> yeah um i'm gonna take them uh, back to for uh, to front um i think the decline of social democracy is something very important to study uh, as is the decline of Christian democracy in some countries, and that we're, we're focusing too, too much on one side of the medallion. The number of studies on, on radical right-wing populist parties is enormous, and the, the, the number of studies on mainstream parties is very small. In the Netherlands, what we observe, and I don't want to make an ecological fallacy here, because we see it at the aggregate level, is that a populist radical right parties are actually doing quite well in areas where the Christian Democrats used to be relatively strong, whereas in uh, areas where the so social Democrats used to be very str strong, it's uh, amongst others um, the social populists that are, that are doing better. But this, of course, also depends on what kinds of offers you have in different European countries, whether there is indeed a social populist party uh, participating. Um, yeah, the work of Catherine Kramer is actually really important, I think. We've tried to take her ideas on board in our project by trying to measure rural resentment attitudes in the Netherlands and the other countries that we're investigating. What we find, and I have no idea whether this is a particular West European thing, is that they are so highly correlated with general populist attitudes that we can't really use them as an alternative explanation. But that's just, I don't know if that's particular or not. The position of, of scholars in all of this is, I think, a very difficult one. I think the first one important thing is to realize how we are perceived. I think that that's very important to, to see, to realize how others see you in society. Uh, being part of a cosmopolitan, highly educated, progressive elite. Um, and to also take that on board in your interactions with uh, the, the kinds of parties and voters that we're talking about, because I don't think we should eschew these. Uh, the, the last question uh, in terms of the, the, the to you from Basel, the, the challenge is, I think, if we are caught between a rock and a hard place as, as political scientists. If we do not engage, if we do not talk about it, others will do that for us. And there's a lot of world explainers out there. Uh, and um, so in one way, we are compelled to somehow take issue. But if we talk too much, if we talk in a certain way, I think we run the risk of, of, um, of, of falling into, again, an ideological trap that we don't accommodate, that we make, we overpromise that we can't deliver. So I, I have no good answer. On the Wisconsin question, I'm having lived in, in Trump country before there was Trump for 20 years in Western PA. Um, I think that doesn't quite apply to Europe because I think cities have a different function in Europe, a different historical function, a different cultural function. And the idea of countryside versus city is present in American 
popular culture and goes back a long, long time. And there is a center periphery discourse there that you cannot simply transpose onto Europe one to one. It's a more complicated story. There were now. You, you take. Just one sentence about what academics do when <coughs> things happen well. Uh, and, well, it depends how you define the situation, you see. I mean, in Poland, uh, for me as a citizen, it is a constitutional crisis. It's a constitutional moment. It is not about everyday politics, right? The government that was elected by 19% of eligible vote is changing the constitution uh, by uh, lower acts on the daily basis. So these are, and uh, I used to say that publicly in the television, this is a violations, these are crimi political criminals. Uh, actually, we had a conference in London, and at the end of the conference, it was about Hungarian and Polish case, somebody stood up and said, why are we listening to this political scientist? It's criminologists that are needed here. But it is true, you know, and it raises this issue, I don't remember who was it that said that, you know, political accountability is a good thing. But in certain contexts, it is very wise to have criminal accountability that is very close to political accountability. Because, you know, if yeah, Turkey is probably another case that it would help, you know, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I think that Seriously, publicly, if you ask me what I do publicly, I did put a forward idea that next time around, if political criminals uh, dismantle the Constitutional Tribunal, which is an institution that is precisely described in the Constitution, well, we need some kind of Swiss guard there with bazookas to defend it. You know, I mean, uh, what can you do? Well, it, it's again back to Turkish. Maybe some kind of military squads are also uh, important. No, I'm, I'm serious. The helplessness we are faced in Poland today is that the executive has all power and it does use this power, right? Can I add? So just to add that, actually, I think academics have the responsibility of reminding people of the importance of uh, institutions that limit executive. So that's very important because that's not. Might, that might be apparent to the uh, regular voter, right? Things has been going well in Poland, so why not give more uh, power to the executive so that he can do whatever he or she pleases? The same in Turkey, but there is much evidence from economics, from political science, that in the medium to long term, weak institutions or weak institutions that check the executive are a recipient for disaster. And that's what's been, I mean, you might say, observing the economic weakness in Turkey. Uh, right now because of the institutional weaknesses. There's no one that can speak without uh, uh, having a permission from Erdogan, for example. So I think that might be something like these checks, the importance of checks, that might be not apparent uh, that much to the people. And we know that populists also want to destroy that. So I think that's, that's one thing where academia can highlight to the public. Thank you. So I had three questions. <laughs> that is exactly my question. <laughs> Should we have one minute more, one statement, or should we at that moment close the session? Who were the three who had uh, hands up? Okay, withdrawal, I guess it's people are leaving, and I think we had a really lively discussion, and I thank you all for coming. And And thanks to the participants once more. Goodbye.